All right. So now we are ready to finish off the play. And the end of this is really just one long battle scene. Scene six is very, very short. And then that is followed by Macbeth finally entering the field. So this one is just uh, Malcolm's army is ready to go. Now near enough. Your leafy screens throw down and show like those you are. You, worthy uncle, shall with my cousin, your right noble son, lead our first battle. Worthy Macduff and we shall take upon us what else remains to do according to our order. Fare you well. Do we but find the tyrant's power tonight. Let us be beaten if we cannot fight. Make all our trumpets speak. Give them all breath. Those clamorous harbingers of blood and death. So now in scene seven, Macbeth enters the field. Notice his attitude as he begins to fight. Now near enough. Oh, that's the same one. Sorry. <laughs> Me to a stake. I cannot fly, but bear like I must fight the course. What he that was not born of woman? Such a one am I to fear or none? What is thy name? Thou be afraid to hear it. No. For thou calls thyself a hotter name than any is in hell. My name's Macbeth. The devil himself could not pronounce a title more hateful to mine ear. No, no more fearful. Thou liest, abhorred tyrant. With my sword, I'll prove the lie thou speaks. Thou wast born of woman. The swords I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn. Brandished by man, the of a woman born. So you see that Macbeth is still clinging to those witches' prophecies, but he, now he's starting to to look for. So now he knows because Burnham Wood moved to Dunsinane. Now he knows that the witches have tricked him. He knows that they lie like truth, he said. So now instead of saying, huh, nobody's gonna beat me, he says, who's he that was not born of a woman? And he says, "I." so he's kind of looking now for how that's going to come down. But I love how he, he, he slays young Seward, he defeats him and Seward is dying and he goes, huh, you, well, you were born of a woman, I guess. So he's still got a little bit of a, cockiness to him. Now here is Macduff's announcement. As Macduff enters the battlefield, he vows that he will not fight anybody but Macbeth. He says, I will come against Macbeth or nobody else. <laughs> Tyrant, show thy face. If thou beast slain, and with no stroke of mine, my wife and children's ghost will haunt thee still. I cannot strike at wretched cons, whose arms are hired to be other steeds. Either thou, Macbeth, or else my sword with an unbattled edge I sheathe again undeeded. There thou shouldst be. By this great clatter, one of greatest note seems bruited. Let me find him, fortune, and more I beg not. This way, my lord. The castle's gently rendered. The tyrant's people on both sides do fight. The noble thanes do bravely in the war. The day almost itself professes yours, and little is to do. We have met with foes that strike beside us. Enter, sir, the castle. And so this is where, in most versions, scene eight would begin. So if you are 
uh, wanting to follow along using the audio that's posted on Kidum at this point, you will need to switch over to scene eight, but they just keep it going here on my Macbeth. And now Macbeth enters the stage again. So you have like Malcolm's people leaving and Macbeth entering. So there's kind of this, they keep missing each other. You know, Macduff is looking for Macbeth and Macbeth is looking for the man, not of woman born. And so the, the stage is kind of chaotic during this battle scene. Why should I play the Roman fool and die on mine own sword? Whilst I see lives, the gashes do better upon them. Tom! Hellhound! Tom! Of all men else I have avoided thee, but get thee back! My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already! I have no words. My voice is in my sword. Thou bloodier villain than Tom's can give thee out! <sighs> <sighs> Thou lootest labor. As easy may start the entrenchant air, but thy keen sword impresses make me bleed. Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. I bear. A charmed life which must not yield to one of woman born. Dispel thy charm, and let the angel whom thou still hast sought tell thee, Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. Cursed be the tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of man. Be these juggling fiends no more believe that palter with us in a double sense that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. I'll not fight with thee. Then yield thee, coward, and live to be the show and gaze of the time. We'll have thee as our rarer monsters are, painted upon a pole, and under it, hear me, you see the tyrant. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rabble's curse. Though Burnham would be come to Dunsinane and thou opposed being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. Before my body, I throw my warlike shield. <sighs> Lay on the death, and damn be him that first cries, Hold! Enough! <laughs> So they exit the field fighting, but just to kind of go through this, as they begin to fight, Macbeth is hesitant to fight Macduff. He says, ah, I've killed enough Macduffs already, but Macduff insists and after they fight for a while Macbeth says ah you're wasting your time I bear a charmed life and no one can hurt me who is born of a woman so he kind of brags about his charmed life and then Macduff says oh well then let me tell you that I was from my mother's womb untimely ripped meaning that he was not born of a woman. He was not naturally born at all. He was delivered basically by a C-section, um, which, you know, using the word ripped makes it pretty clear his mother did not survive that process. But he was, so he was not naturally delivered. And that is how the witches created that little trickery. And so at first when he hears that, Macbeth is like, oh, well, I'm not going to fight you then. And Macduff says, fine, don't fight me. We'll just, ha we'll, we'll put a sign up and we'll keep you in a cage and we'll say, come see the tyrant. And so Macbeth is like, yeah, you know what? Um, I'm not gonna, I'd rather die than kiss the ground before Malcolm's feet. So I will try to the last. And so he still has that attitude of I'm gonna go down fighting. And they fight their way right off the field and now enter Malcolm. <sighs> A 
I would the friends we miss were safe arrived. Some must go off. And yet, by these I see so great a day as this is cheaply bought. Macduff is missing, and your noble son. Your son, my lord, has paid a soldier's debt. He only lived but till he was a man. The which no sooner had his prowess confirmed in the unshrinking station where he fought, but like a man he died. Then he is dead. Aye, and brought off the field. Your cause of sorrow must not be measured by his worth, for then it hath no end. Had he his hurts before? Aye, on the front. Why then, God's soldier be he. Had I as many sons as I have hairs, I would not wish them to a fairer death. And so his knell is known. He's worth more sorrow. And that I'll spend for him. He's worth no more. They say he parted well and paid his score. And so God be with him. Here comes newer comfort. Hail, King, for so thou art. Behold, where stands the usurper's cursed head? The time is free. I see thee compassed with thy kingdom's battle. I'd speak my salutation in their minds, whose voices I desire aloud with mine. Hail, King of Scotland. Hail, King of Scotland! We shall not spend a large expense of time before we reckon with your several loves and make us even with you. My thanes and kinsmen, henceforth be earls, the first that ever Scotland in such an honour named. What's more to do, which would be planted newly with the time, as calling home our exiled friends abroad that fled the snares of watchful tyranny, producing forth the cruel ministers of this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen, who as tis thought by self and violent hands to cough her life, this and what needful else that calls upon us, by the grace of grace we will perform in measure, time and place. So thanks to all at once and to each one, whom we invite to see us crowned at Schoon. And thus ends the tragedy of Macbeth. Macduff enters with Macbeth's head held high. And as Seward points out, uh, he says, this day was cheaply bought, meaning really after such a battle as this, we didn't lose that many men because as they had mentioned earlier, the people who were fighting for Macbeth kept switching sides. They were wanted to fight for Malcolm in the end. And so then Malcolm becomes king and he makes a nice, lovely little speech that he will from henceforth call all the Thanes earls. And he uses this great phrase for Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. He says this dead butcher and his fiend like queen. So. Now I would like for you to consider on your last question on Kittim, what do you think, is it correct to call Macbeth a butcher and Lady Macbeth fiend-like? And did they get what they deserved? Was this play a tragedy? Watching their downfall were these honorable, noble people who experienced the downfall because of too much ambition and too much pride and the interference of the witches? Or were they a butcher and a fiend-like queen who got what they deserved? <laughs> <laughs>